Welcome to the MIT Robotics Seminar Series. Uh, first, I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Toyota Research Institute, Skydio, uh, Amazon Robotics, and Symbotic. So it's, it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker for today. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Rebecca Kramer Botiglio. Uh, uh, Rebecca has got her PhD here locally in Rob Wood's lab uh, in Harvard. Uh, but currently, she is a professor at Yale University, and uh, where she leads the laboratory, uh, laboratory research lab. I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Yes. Uh, and her research interests are very, very diverse, uh, spanning uh, materials uh, uh, science, uh, new materials for robotics, uh, uh, manufacturing processes, and also uh, and also robotics. Uh, so uh, she will be talking about. Uh, her research in the lab, and uh, I think that the topic is, I, I'm told that the, you, uh, that the, the topic is potentially uh, adaptable to the audience. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> exactly welcome, fun. Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm very excited to tell you about some of the work uh, that we're, we're working on in the lab, um, mainly uh, shape-shifting robots and some materials mixed in. But before I get into that, I want to start with the robot cliche. So when you ask people to conjure up an image of a robot, most people think of something like this. These are rigid machines that perform repeated tasks. They're very good at what they're designed to do, right? These are fast and strong and precise. But what they are not is safe for human robot interaction. You don't see people working alongside these robots. And they're not adaptable. You don't see these robots adapting to changing tasks and environments because that's not what they've been designed to do. But when we all imagine robots for the future, I think we all imagine something more like this, like animals, like ourselves. We are incredibly adaptable. We readily adapt our body configuration and our behavior to different tasks and different environments. We even adapt our body properties, right? So we can stiffen and soften in order to perform both forceful and gentle tasks. OK, so how do we do that? And how do we get robots to do it? Well. I noticed something when watching all of these videos. All of these robots, or <laughs> robots, all of these animals, <laughs> look at least partially soft. OK, so we can take a deeper dive into that observation. So yeah, as it turns out, all known animals in the world are at least partially soft. These are all the known animals in the world, about a million at the time of this data. And there are no known animals that are completely rigid, which is in contrast to the way that we typically design robots and machines. And if we look at this even further, we find that over half of known animals in the world are completely soft, contain no rigid components whatsoever. OK, so there's some things to think about when you're talking about completely soft animals. Completely soft animals, you think of things like jellyfish that live in the water, worms that live in the ground. We, as humans, are a fairly large animal that lives on the ground, so we require some rigid component, our skeletal structure, to keep us standing up. Even so, on average, humans are only 15% rigid bone skeletal structure, skeletal material, and 85% soft and fluid materials. Right? So, wow, this begs the question, does our soft material composition play any role in our ability to interact with and adapt to our environment? And if so, could soft robotic technologies be part of the solution to the adaptability problem? OK, so I am by no means the first or the only person to be asking these questions, to be thinking about soft robotic technologies. Soft robotics is a rapidly growing field. There are pioneers of soft robotics here at MIT. And soft robots have many potential benefits. So here I want to show three soft robots from the literature that showcase these benefits very well, or a few of them anyway. The first, in this video, you see this locomotion robot locomoting out into the street where it gets run over by a car. It's able to continue that locomotion despite this extreme impact owing to its soft material composition, its ability to absorb those forces. In the middle, you can see a soft robotic manipulator. This is a pneumatic elastomer robot, and the soft materials are able to conform around diverse and delicate objects. And over on your right, you can see a wearable platform. So this a wearable robot that could potentially increase efficiency of the wearer or augment load capacity without restricting the natural mechanics of motion of the wearer. OK, so as brilliant as all of these robots are, they are still all task specific. 
So all of these robots have been designed for a specific use case, and they wouldn't operate well outside of that intended use case. So the locomotion system would not operate well for manipulation and wearability. The manipulation platform wouldn't work well for locomotion and wearability, and so on. So my question is this. Can we design more adaptive robots? Can we build robots that can adapt in morphology and properties and behavioral control policies to changing tasks and environments the way we do? So this is the question I've been asking for some time and many others, I'm certainly not alone in this quest, um, but the specific angle that my lab takes towards answering this question is to develop new multifunctional materials and infuse them into soft robot platforms in order to achieve some of these new behaviors such as adaptive morphology. So one of our core competencies is we're really good at emulsifying things. So we take bulk responsive materials and we break them down into small discrete components, which we can then potentially leverage for different manufacturing processes or mix them into other bulk responsive materials to create multifunctional composites. And then again, moving them into some new soft robot platforms with an eye towards adaptive morphology and behavioral control policy. Okay, so here's where we get to the adaptive component of the talk. Um, so I wasn't quite sure what this community would want to hear about today. I wasn't sure if you would want to hear more about materials or robots or a mix of both. So I prepared slides on five different topics, um, but we'll only have time to talk about two. So I thought I would let you all choose your own adventure uh, with this talk today. So I'll give you a snippet of what each of these is about, and then I think we'll just do a voting process to decide what we want to hear about today. Uh, so stretchable electronics will mostly uh, aim at gallium indium alloys, liquid metals that we initially started looking at as sensors, but found a formulation that is strain insensitive. Um, so this will look at, a, it's a very materials focused component that will look at a, a uh, biphasic gallium indium that we can use to port traditional circuit designs into soft stretchable forms. Robotic skins is about 2D elastic membranes with embedded actuation and sensing that we can wrap around inert deformable objects in order to turn them into robots from the surface. It's probably the oldest component in this mix. Robotic fabrics looks at a suite of functional fibers that we've developed for actuation sensing and variable stiffness and how we infuse those into regular everyday fabrics in order to roboticize them. Morphing robots, although that's a very broad category, it focuses on a turtle and tortoise inspired platform that we've developed for amphibious locomotion and we've looked at cost of transport across multi-environment locomotion. And finally, granular actuators is another very material focused one where we have made particle form phase change actuators and we look at the intersection between soft actuation and granularity. Okay, so with that snippet of each, I guess we'll vote for just what you want to hear now, and then this slide will reappear later so you can vote for the second topic later. Anyone want to hear about stretchable electronics? Very low interest for stretchable, okay, a few people. Robotic skins, okay, a few people there, maybe a little bit more robotic fabrics. Ooh, many more people. Okay, that is a winner so far. Morphing robots, turtle robots. Ooh, that's probably the second most, uh, and then granular actuators, that's lowest. Okay, so I definitely saw the most interest in robotic fabrics and the turtle robot. Um, so we'll just, we'll do those two topics. You guys feel good about that? Cool, okay. Um, we'll start with robotic fabrics. Okay, so what is a robotic fabric? It's exactly what it sounds like. A fabric that has been made into a robot with infused sensing, actuation, and variable stiffness. So the, fa uh, the approach that we've taken here is to make all of these components fiber form with an eye towards keeping the fiber architecture of the neat fabric. So there's so many brilliant technical fabrics that have been designed with specific mechanical and other properties. And we want to retain those properties while also introducing robotic function into the fabric. It's completely ubiquitous, right? So I'm wearing fabric, you're wearing fabric, the carpet is fabric, my backpack is fabric. The idea of roboticizing some of these components uh, or these, these products is really appealing. So getting into the functional fibers, uh, we've developed this suite of actuation, sensing, and variable stiffness fibers, and I'm going to walk you through them one at a time. So for actuation, we chose shape memory alloy. Are people familiar with shape memory alloy? Maybe a little bit, I see a lot of nodding. Okay, it's a metallic alloy uh, that can change between two crystalline phases. Uh, 
martensite and austenite, and it can be programmed to remember a shape, hence shape memory alloy. Um, so we can program it. Usually, people buy these in wire form. So what you see in the corner here, you can buy these in long wires, and you can program them to remember coils. So when you apply current, it dual heats, and it contracts into this coiled shape that it's remembering. You get up to 50% linear contractions, quite a lot of force. Um, now, when we tried to put those wires into our fabrics via couching, which is this threading technique that you see to attach it to the fabric, we got really chaotic actuation, right? So you can imagine something attached to a fabric coiling and it's you know, popping out of plane, it's crumpling, it's wrinkling the fabric, uh, very chaotic. We saw it overturning within its couching and creating odd motions that we didn't program for. Uh, so the way that we overcame this challenge was by flattening the shape memory alloy wires. We, shot, we flattened them from wires into ribbons. And by doing this, we were able to program in really nice controllable bends. Um, so here you can see the controllable bend that uh, this is just a single shape memory alloy ribbon and then integrated via couching into a fabric. Um, you can see the bend there. And for the purpose of sensing, we developed a Pickering emulsion. So a Pickering emulsion is an emulsion that's stabilized by even smaller particles around each emulsion particle. Uh, so here we have PDM PDMS precursor. This is a Silgard 184, a uh, very common PDMS that people use. And it's suspended in this ethanol solution by carbon black particles. Uh, and that's what's stabilizing the emulsion and preventing all of the precursor particles from spontaneously recoalescing. We can print these directly into fabrics, maintaining the neat architecture, and use them in order to control the fabric. And I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail. So the way this works, like I said, we have the precursor uh, elastomer emulsion stabilized by carbon black. That's the conductive component. And when we print this onto a surface, any surface, doesn't have to be fabric, the carrier solvent, the ethanol that the emulsion is suspended in, evaporates away very quickly, right? Ethanol likes to evaporate. And that destabilizes the emulsion. So now there's nothing that it's suspended in. These emulsion particles destabilize. The elastomer starts to leak out. It self-mixes with the carbon black, self-coagulates on the surface, and self-forms into a conductive composite. So here you can see the just deposited emulsion, and then the PDMS starts to leak out, and we have this self-formed conductive composite on the surface. Now, we actually developed this Pickering emulsion uh, for the purpose of just trying to create a really non-toxic printable conductive composite. So usually, we could take carbon black particles and just mix them directly into PDMS. This is a really viscous solution. It's not very printable. Um, we would thin it with something kind of toxic like cyclohexane or toluene, but we don't want to print those onto fabrics or onto our skin, right? That would not be, that would not feel good. Um, so we were looking to mix this with ethanol, which is why we created the Pickering emulsion. And then it just kind of turned out that when we printed it onto fabrics, it did something unexpected. We didn't actually plan for this originally. It self coats around the individual fibers without filling the spaces between them. So we were able to retain the neat architecture of the fabric without, uh, without again, filling it with elastomer and changing the mechanical properties locally of the fabric. So here you can see this is a fabric put on a backlight. So the white spots you see are light shining through the fabric. And we can measure the porosity this way. So a neat fabric without any uh, Pickering emulsion printed on, in this case, has about 5% porosity. An inked fabric, where we printed our Pickering emulsion on, retains quite a bit of that porosity. And here we've strained it, so we expect to see more porosity. Okay, so we go ahead and print our Pickering emulsion onto commercial fabrics. In this case, we're using kinesthesiology tape, and you can see our subject here is bending her arm, and we're getting uh, the neat signal, the voltage change, with that resistive sensor. And finally, we print it onto a more robotic fabric. So this has our shape memory alloy ribbons that are attached to the fabric. And we have a Pickering emulsion sensor that's printed on top of the fabric and on bottom of the fabric. And we're commanding the fabric to just bend up and bend down, bend up, bend down. And we're using those two sensors in order to actually control this motion. Now, it's pretty jittery, but that's more of a function of the controller that we're using, the really rudimentary controller that we're using, uh, and not so much the sensor signal. OK, now to round out our suite of functional fibers, we also developed a fiber for variable stiffness. This allows us to perform move and hold type operations. So the fabric can move into a new shape and then stiffen in that shape to passively hold it without continuous power supply. Um, it also allows us to apply more you know, force on our environment and on other objects, um, so to execute forceful tasks. 
So for the purpose of variable stiffness, we relied on two materials, a thermoset polymer, which undergoes a glass transition temperature and changes by an order of magnitude and stiffness when it does undergo that glass transition temperature, and also the melting of Fields metal particles. So Fields metal is a combination of indium, bismuth, and tin, and it has a melting point around 60 degrees Celsius. So when we heat it up, it melts into a liquid. When it's below that melting temperature, it's a solid metal. So I'll start by talking about the Fields metal particles. The way we make these is we melt the Fields metal. We heat it above 60 degrees. We have molten Fields metal in a warm water bath. And then we apply a lot of energy. So we sonicate or homogenate. And we break this up into smaller particles. And then we cool it down while continuing that energy in order to have them actually freeze or uh, become solid in their particle shape. And so we can make bulk Fields metal into small particles. Um, we've since adapted this process. You can imagine that this is a pretty uh, aggravated process, that these particles are hitting into each other. We get really high dispersity of the particles, um, and they're very, very non-uniform, um, really non-spherical. We've since adapted the process um, to use a shear thinning solution. So we actually have them cooling down when we remove the homogenization. The, uh, the medium solidifies, and they cool down um, without bumping into one another. We get much, much more spherical particles, which is what you can see pictured here. OK, so then we mix this into our thermoset polymer. And we get this two-stage softening effect. Um, so if I can just draw your attention to the yellow lines and the black lines. The yellow ones are with no Fields metal. So that's just the neat thermoset polymer. We have it initially in its stiff state. We heat it up, and it goes through the glass transition. And it softens by about an order of magnitude. Now, when we add in the Fields metal particles, it's initially stiffer, because now we have a polymer that was already pretty stiff, but it includes solid metal particles as well. So it's even stiffer. When we go through, we start to heat it. We go through the glass transition. It drops by an order of magnitude and stiffness there. We continue to heat it up, and then it goes through the melting point of the particles. So now we have solid metal particles that turn into liquid inclusions, and we have this huge second drop in stiffness. And so it goes into an almost three order of magnitude range between cool and hot states um, and this huge range in stiffness that we use for our variable stiffness fibers. And we did optimize these. So I didn't go into this optimization much, but we found that approximately 50 micron diameter and inclusion about 46% by volume maximizes the stiffness range uh, without embrittling the material too much. And looking at this relative some, uh, to some other variable stiffness materials in the literature, um, so here we have our material. This is the neat thermoset epoxy, 30% uh, by volume and 55% by volume inclusion of Fields metal. And we compare this to things like Fields metal in bulk tubes or in, in enclosures, and also uh, thermoplastics, so ABS and PLA that also undergo glass transition temperatures and jamming. Um, and so what you can see here is actually a pretty large range in stiffness. So at the lower end, our material is softer than latex rubber. Um, and at the higher end, it's about as stiff as acrylic. Um, so quite a large range that you can see there. OK, so now we can put all of our functional fibers together. This is where you get to see them actually behaving as robots. Uh, so here we have these robots that we've designed with our actuation sensing and variable stiffness fibers. We go ahead, it starts in this initial flat configuration. We soften the variable stiffness frame. We use our shape memory alloy ribbons in order to lift it up into this table-like platform. Then we cool the variable stiffness frame. So now it's passively holding that new position. And we can hold weights. We put some weight on it. We put more weight on it. You can see it sinks down a little bit here. And then we soften our variable stiffness frame again. And we use antagonistic actuators in order to lay it back down into its initial flat configuration. In a second demonstration, we made morphing wings around this, this airplane. Um, so this work was uh, funded by AFOSR. So we were inspired to do um, a flying type demo. And this was inspired by uh, the 1903 Wright Flyer, which also had fabric wings. So in this case, again, it starts deployed. We soften the variable stiffness fibers. We use the shape memory alloy ribbons in order to wrap it around the fuselage. We can cool it there and hold it there passively. When we want to deploy the wings, we soften again and use the antagonistic shape memory alloy ribbons in order to bring the wings back out. Um, now, this is a completely untethered demonstration. So uh, all of our electronics and microcontroller um, power supply, they're all inside this 3D printed fuselage. 
I do commonly get asked whether it can fly. No, this did not fly. Um, but it does kind of glide, so it you know, falls with style. All right, and this is our, as close as we got to an actual wearable demonstration. So this was designed to be an active reactive tourniquet. So what you see here, we go in, we cut a sensor, and this simulates damage. So the idea is that this would be around a limb. You can imagine that the foam on the inside is actually my arm going through this cuff. And it's getting damaged. We're cutting the sensors, and that triggers a response. So as each sensor gets cut, the corresponding variable stiffness fiber softens, the corresponding actuator contracts, and then the variable stiffness fiber cools and holds that retracted position uh, or contracted position passively. So in our newest work, I'm actually very excited to share this with you today. This is some unpublished work. You saw in that first demonstration that we had this table-like platform, right? So it started in this flat thing, and it lifts up into a table and then lays back down. But you don't see it actually locomoting. This was all quasi-static. We didn't show any dynamic behavior. And this was very much based on the limitations of the fibers and our hardware that we had developed at the time. So in our newest work, we wanted to introduce dynamic motions. We had that thing standing up, and we thought, hey, it really looks like it could be a quadruped. It looks like it should be able to walk. Um, so we pushed it towards here. And this is our, our newest robotic fabric that is dynamically walking. We show it in two different gates, um, only one of which is displayed here. Uh, and the biggest innovations here, well, this is also fully untethered. So this is carrying around its own power supply and controller um, that you can see snap fitted onto the top of the fabric. And the biggest thing that enabled dynamic locomotion in this robotic fabric was a change in the variable stiffness fiber. So here, instead of using our Fields Metal Thermoset Epoxy Composite, we use what we're calling variable stiffness SMA that you can see on the top there. So we take our shape memory alloy ribbons that we previously were using as actuators, and now you know, we did some clever cuts in the middle in order to allow it to bend more easily, and we programmed it to remember this half pipe shape. So this is a really well-known stiffening effect, right? It's the dollar bill effect or the pizza effect. When it's just flat, it's very floppy and compliant. When you put a small bend in it, it becomes very rigid and load-bearing. So simple in concept, we just program these to remember this small bend. And so when we apply current, they stiffen. They bend and stiffen. And so now these are actively stiffening versus passively stiffening which is quite important, especially within lab demos. So commonly when people would visit my lab and I would show them robotic fabrics, I would you know, go and find a cool, just whatever robotic fabric was sitting on the table. When I say cool, I mean not neat, but actually at room temperature. And so it was rigid. And I would say, hey, look, it's just like a crumply fabric and it turns into a robot and I would start to crumple it, but it was passively rigid and quite brittle and I would often break it. Um, so now they really are passively soft and can crumple at room temperature. Um, and when we apply current to the variable stiffness shape memory alloy uh, pieces, they actively become rigid. OK, and just to end with a little bit of vision, why would we want to roboticize fabric and make locomoting fabrics? This is the direction that we're moving in. Um, as we will see in the next section, you guys picked uh, an amphibious multi-environment uh, robot to talk about next as well. I'm really interested in multi-environment locomotion. And so when I think about where fabrics could be used in this case, um, certainly parachutes are very, very common. Um, it's a really great technical fabric. Could be roboticized in order to you know, get some coarse flight path um, and deliver a payload to a coarse location where then our fabric uh, could turn into a terrestrial locomotor and deliver uh, that payload to you know, some place a denied space, and difficult to access, or something that's not um, accessible from the air. Um, so this is just, uh, I guess, a vision thought that we are, we're moving forward with. OK, and with that, I believe we voted for turtles next. Yes? OK, jumping right in. All right, morphing robots based on sea turtles and land tortoises. So this is a project that we're working on with ONR, the Office of Naval Research. Um, and it started with just a challenge. Uh, a conceptual challenge. How do we locomote across land and water? These are drastically different environments, and efficient locomotion across these two very different environments is a huge challenge. So we were thinking about how we could use morphological adaptation in order to address this challenge. And we started by just looking at amphibious robots in the literature and amphibious animals. So what are all the amphibious animals? What locomotes really well on land? What locomotes really well in water? And where are their morphological similarities? 
And what we landed on was sea turtles and land tortoises, which are morphologically incredibly similar, right? So they both have this carapace, this central hull. They're both quadrupeds. Um, but where they differ is primarily in their limbs. Sea turtles have these elongated, flexible flippers. Land tortoises have rounded limbs that are much more specialized for land locomotion and load bearing. But this isolates where the morphological adaptation would need to occur. So we built a robot inspired by this system. And this just came out this past October. And we were super excited that this got published in Nature and was actually on the cover. Um, so you can see our cover image there. And here is the robot. So what we have is this morphing limb platform. The limb is neutrally in flipper position, and it morphs into a leg position. And I'll describe that in a bit in just a moment. Um, and then we have it attached to a more traditional robot. So the robot body itself contains all of uh, our traditional servo motors that make up the shoulder joints, and again, has all of our uh, power supply and controllers, electronics on board, and nicely protected within the central hull. So taking a closer look at the limb, let's talk about what it's made of. So this is made of a thermoset epoxy. It's actually the exact same one that we use in our variable stiffness materials that were just described for robotic fabrics. That's the clear stuff that you can see in the middle. And we heat it with a laser cut copper heater. Um, so that's the serpentine heater that you can see behind the thermoset epoxy. And this whole thing is coupled to pneumatic actuators along the entire length of the limb. So what we do is we start by applying a current to the heater. We soften our variable stiffness material. Once it's softened, we use the pneumatic actuators in order to morph it into its leg shape. So you can see it puffs out from a flat flipper shape to a rounded cross section for load bearing. And we have this foot that folds under for stable contact with the ground. So that's the foot at the end there. Um, and then we can cool it in order to lock it into this new configuration. And when we want to go back to flipper state, we simply apply current to the heater again, warm our variable stiffness material, and the stored elastic energy relaxes the entire configuration back to neutral flipper. So here you can see a side view of the morphological change, the leg mode and flipper mode. Uh, and here you can see also how we actually attach it to the full robot body. So each of the shoulders has three uh, servos, three dynamixels. That gives us our three degrees of uh, motion at the shoulder joints. Um, and then also inside, like I said, we house all of our electronics and power communication uh, and controllers. Although in some of the videos that you'll see, we do have uh, communication and power um, tethered as well. So we're generally calling this idea adaptive morphogenesis. And this is the design strategy of using morphological adaptation uh, in order to specialize for different environments or different tasks. So this is in contrast to the way most amphibious robots are designed, which use distinctive propulsion mechanisms. So usually you would have a system that has a propulsion mechanism for one environment and a second propulsion mechanism for another environment. And then they would retract one and deploy one depending on which environment they're in. But that means they're always carrying a propulsion system as a payload. And this has efficiency losses. So what we wanted to test with this work was whether we could have efficiency gains by instead of deploying different propulsion mechanisms, actually unifying them into one and adapting it on the fly. So let's take a look at our robot in motion. So here we have it in flipper mode. Uh, and it's swimming. Um, we're showing flapping gates here. We also did paddling gates. So these are lift-based gates. Um, you know, paddling gates are drag-based gates. I don't have any videos of them here because it's just not as impressive to watch the paddling gates. I think the flapping gates are much nicer. Um, but you can see it doing some standard maneuvers. It's swimming straight. It's diving. It's surfacing. Um, and we have quite a bit of control. One thing to note is that these gates are inspired by real sea turtles. So we are collaborating on this project with Frank Frisch from Westchester University, who is a sea turtle biologist. And he helped us to program sea turtle inspired gates. And you only see them being employed by the two front flippers, the four flippers. And you see the back flippers just trailing behind. So in real sea turtles, if you watch videos of real sea turtles, uh, they don't have these large back flippers, right? They have really big extended front flippers. And their hind flippers are small. They're small, but they primarily use them as rudders. Um, and so we employed that same strategy here of just trailing behind our, our back flippers. And, and really, we're not even using them as rudders here. They're just uh, completely passive. We have four equally 
sized flippers because we need to use them for the terrestrial mode as well. So we need four limbs for terrestrial mode. Um, there's very little literature or very little inspiration, I should say, uh, on four flipper swimming methods um, because there's really no animals that, that showcase this. There are no known animals right now that have four equally sized flippers the way our robot does. But interestingly, there was a dinosaur, a plesiosaur, that had four equally sized flippers. And there is a bit of literature on the four flipper swimming method deriving from the plesiosaur. Um, so this is a really fun thing that we're working on right now is looking at the four sw flipper swimming method um, from you know, ancient dinosaur, Jurassic period, uh, plesiosaurs, and using that in order to use all four flippers and whether that has efficiency gains, lowers the cost of transport in aquatic mode for our robot. Okay, so now we can take the robot out of the water and put it on the land and let it go into terrestrial mode. So here we've morphed our limbs into leg mode and we have it walking all over Yale's campus. Um, so this is, these upper videos are right outside of our lab on Hill House Avenue. These are some other spots on campus. Um, the robot here is employing a quasi-static gait. This is a creeping gait. It means it always has three legs in contact with the ground at any given time to form a stable tripod while it sweeps one leg out and takes a step forward. Um, I think another thing to note here is that this, yeah, like I said, this is not a super dynamic gait. The cost of transport is reasonable, and I will show this in a minute. I'll show uh, cost of transport uh, comparisons, um, but we are working on porting the robot into Majoko and deriving more efficient gates on land. These are hand-designed gates, uh, certainly not optimized gates. Okay, uh, the robot you see walking on very rigid substrates. You see it walking on sidewalk and on stone here. Um, you don't see it walking on soft substrates because we found that it failed. The legs would slip out. So we did program in one last gate for these, uh, these softer substrates. So things like the transition zone, like sand, where we actually care about transitioning from land into water and water into land. Um, so here, what we did is we just embraced that the legs display out in the upright creeping gate, and we put the robot on the ground, its belly in contact with the ground. Um, we still keep the limbs in leg mode because they're stronger in this position when we have them in flipper mode. It's still lifting itself up a little bit, right? So you can see that during the gate, it's lifting itself up just a tiny bit, and there's quite a lot of force being put through these limbs. Um, and so we did get cracking in the limbs if we left them in flipper mode, but in leg mode, they were able to withstand this force. Uh, another thing I'll note is, yeah, this is very inspired by the way real sea turtles crawl in the sand. Um, and this video that you see of the sea turtle here uh, is one that I actually took myself. Um, so I was working with a sea turtle biologist down at Florida Atlantic University studying the amphibious behaviors of real sea turtles. And so that's me behind the camera watching the sea turtle crawl into the water. All right, so we can put these all together and now execute a full transition. So here the robot, like I said, its upright creeping gait is not stable on soft granular substrates. So you don't see it using that upright creeping gait at all in this video. The first thing it does is just sit down. So it starts standing up. We don't take any steps. It sits down and starts using its crawling gait in order to enter the water. Now this is an ocean inlet near Yale's campus. So this is ocean water, but you can see that it's very, very calm. It is very inlet, uh, not by the ocean without much wave energy, a more controlled environment for this uh, initial field testing. So here the robot is crawling into the water, and then eventually when it gets deep enough, we want to transition the limbs from leg mode into flipper mode and start employing a swimming gait. Now what you'll see is when that happens, the video will actually blank out, and we'll just say transition the limbs, and then it will go back in, and you'll be able to see swimming mode. And the reason for this is you might notice when we have the zoomed out visions here of the area that we did this testing during the winter. There is no greenery in the background, right? Everything looks dead. Um, so it was freezing when we were doing this testing. It was very cold. It was March and the water was very cold. And now you also might remember that our morphing material, our thermoset epoxy, is thermally responsive. So we rely on heating in order to morph the limb and this water was very, very cold. It didn't matter how much we tried, how much energy we pumped into the system, uh, we couldn't get the limbs to morph underwater. Um, so there are a couple of solutions to this. The first is to go back when it's warmer. 
Um, so we took the robot back to the same exact spot in the summertime. Now you can see all the greenery and people are canoeing in the background. And we have the same transition. So you saw the robot standing up, it sits down, it starts crawling into the water. We found that the energetics of morphing underwater the water was still quite cold here, uh, and we found the energetics were just really, really cumbersome. Um, and so we adapted this strategy of lifting the limbs out of the water and morphing them in the air before then putting them back in and moving, crawling a bit when the buoyancy was different, when it was a little bit sunken into the water where it wasn't putting as much weight along the limbs, um, crawling out more, and then swimming. Okay. Um, so like I said, we can, we can look at cost of transport in the respective environments for the robot, and then I'll talk more about how we mitigated this thermally responsive issue, this temperature dependence issue. Um, first, looking at cost of transport, we compared our system, here you can see our system, Yale Amphibious Robotic Turtle, ART for short. We compared it in crawling mode, walking mode, and swimming mode, uh, looking at cost of transport as a function of body mass to other amphibious robots in the literature, as well as many animals. Um, and what we find is that in its respective environments, terrestrial environments and aquatic environments, it's pretty comparable to a lot of other purpose-built, single environment robots. So there's just a few that I'll point out that you might be familiar with. Uh, Cheetah Cub, Titan, your MIT learning biped. There they are on the cost of transport plot. So these are terrestrial only robots. Right? So this is their cost of transport in terrestrial only mode. Um, if we look at a few uh, swimming robots that you might be familiar with, Tunabot, robotic jellyfish, here we see our, our uh, swimming robot, Yale Art, um, actually has a pretty favorable cost of transport. But it's really important to note that we were not trying to show that the cost of transport in any respective environment was better than purpose-built robots for a single environment, but rather that it's comparable, that we can maintain a comparable cost of transport on land and in water while doing both. Now, notably, we didn't look at the cost of morphing. So this just evaluates cost of transport in water, cost of transport on land, and not at the transition. And there is certainly a large cost to morphing. Notably, what I was talking about, an extremely large cost to morphing that we couldn't even attain in cold environments because of our temperature dependence, right? So we care about the temperature of the water, the temperature of the environment, and that costs more and more and more because our thermally responsive variable stiffness material uh, needs to warm in order to change in stiffness. So this is the newest generation of the robot. This is unpublished work, again, that I'm very excited to share with you. Um, we've kept a lot of the same features, but we have namely adapted the variable stiffness material. So here, the limbs are no longer including this thermally responsive thermoset epoxy. Instead, we use layer jamming here. Um, so we have 30 layers of PET in each limb, um, and we pull a vacuum in order to jam them together, and that stiffens the limb, and we let uh, atmospheric pressure back in in order to soften the limb. Um, my students are working on cutting out the limbs or the, the layers with kirigami patterns in order to reduce the bending energy so that we can morph into these bent, uh, the, the changes from flattened to rounded cross section um, with very, very little energy expenditure, um, but it doesn't change the uh, jam to unjam stiffness ratio. Um, so that's something that we're working on right now. Uh, the other changes that we made, you might see that the robot looks a little bit more stout. Uh, so the limbs are actually still the same length, but uh, the shoulder has been redesigned, so it's sitting a little bit lower to the ground. That's why it looks a bit more stout, and it's much, much more stable in terrestrial mode now. So while the previous robot could not uh, walk on that, um, that sandy, you know, water-packed granular environment that you saw in the transition videos, it was too unstable in its creeping gait to walk there, this robot can. So this can execute a full creeping gait to crawling to swimming transition um, where, the, where the other robot was not able to. Now certainly there are design trade-offs that I want to mention. Um, so by removing the variable stiffness material that was thermally responsive and replacing it with this jamming pneumatically res or pressure responsive material, we have solved the temperature dependence, uh, the dependence on the temperature of the environment. But we've introduced additional challenges, right? Now, because now we need to pull a vacuum. Um, so you can see that we have more tubing coming off of the robot. So there have been design trade-offs. But this is where uh, the next generation of the robot currently stands. OK, so I think I'm out of time. So with here, I'm going, I, this I'm going to wrap up. Um, so I hope 
you've, I hope that uh, I've been able to teach you a little bit about some of the, the robot platforms that we're working on. I didn't get to talk about some of the more materials uh, projects that we're, that we're doing, but you, I, I guess, especially got to hear about those with the robotic fabrics and the different emulsions that we're, we're developing in order to infuse these new behaviors into our robot platforms um, in order to go from material innovation towards new uh, robots that showcase adaptive morphology and behavioral control policy toward changing tasks and environments. So I want to thank my group. Uh, my group, they're, they're filled with brilliant students and postdocs. Uh, they do all the work. Um, I just report it to you all. I um, also want to thank funding sources and thank you for your attention. All right, we have plenty of time for questions. Thanks, that was some really cool stuff. Um, out of curiosity, uh, what would it take for the uh, falling with style robot to actually fly? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, we certainly need to lighten it, it's quite heavy. Um, and we need to, I mean the shape of those, of those uh, the fabric wings is not at all optimized for any lift-based anything. So they're really not even airfoils at the moment. Um, they're pretty crudely designed. So we would need to give a lot more thought to the structure of actually making it an airfoil and looking at the, the, the dynamics, the, the hydrodynamics, not hydrodynamics, aerodynamics um, of the wings. And then, yeah, I think lightening it quite a bit and redesigning the wings to actually have the appropriate shape um, and then giving it some actual propulsion mechanism, right? Sure. So right now that's not, you know, producing anything that would propel it forward. Uh, but yeah, so those, those things should make it fly. Cool, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering for your sensing fibers with the carbon nanotubes or yeah, carbon black, um, is that resistance based? Yeah, oh okay. great, yeah. Thanks, thanks for asking this question. So they are resistive sensors. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the conductive composite self-coagulates around all of the independent fibers. Um, so each fiber in itself could be viewed as an individual sensor, but they do overlap. So there are cross points and in bulk, it is one large resistance, uh, resistive sensor. Mm -hmm. um, as you might, since you're asking this question about resistive sensors, you might be aware that resistive sensors do have some drawbacks, right? There's high hysteresis, and especially in this case, where the fibers are you know, moving relative to one another, it's not only based on just a change in strain geometry, length geometry, but also the shifting of the fibers with strain. Um, so in order to improve on this, we have been looking towards making capacitive versions of this um, in order to you know, print it on each side and use a central fabric layer as a dielectric. Uh, but that's something we're currently working towards. Okay, thank you. Are you using those for any contact sensing too, or mostly strain sensing right now? Right now, strain sensing alone. Mm -hmm. But that is, that's a good, I, just as you know, with any other resistance-based sensor, um, you know, it would respond to a host of different deformations. Yep. Um, so they're controlled right now in all of our experiments. It's been strain, uh, they're pretty sensitive to strain. I imagine that they would also be sensitive to uh, to touch and um, pressures, although I don't, I don't know off the top of my head if we would be able, I don't think that we would be able to distinguish those modes, um, pressure versus strain modes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is, you talked about like alternative stiffening methods for the walking robot. Is there anything similar that's applicable to the fiber robots? Yeah, so the um, so like I said, we I guess in both robots we ended up moving away from thermally responsive variable stiffness mechanisms. So both started with this thermoset epoxy, um, one of which had the integrated Fields metal particles as well. We get great uh, st stiffness range there, right? The the cool to hot stiffness range of of this composite is um, quite large, but we in both cases I think had issues, well, in one case, uh, with it being actively, passively stiff versus actively stiff, which is what we were looking for. Um, and then in the second case, thermally responsive has a coupling to the environment. So we got rid of the thermoset epoxy in both cases um, and moved into other mechanisms. So yeah, we're using the jamming for the, um, the, the turtle robot now, and we're using um, 
this shape memory alloy, you know, half pipe curve, curved effect versus flat effect um, for the fabric robots now. Um, there are a host of other uh, variable stiffness mechanisms in the literature. I think jamming is quite popular right now, though. People are looking at fiber jamming, um, and even elastic versions, so stretchable versions of fiber jamming um, and, and layer jamming. Um, so I think that that's an exciting area right now. Okay. And would it be possible to use the shape memory alloys on a wearable application, or is that too hot for something that's in close contact? I think it's possible. Um, shape memory alloys, they, they do get hot. Um, and in contact with your skin, it would be uncomfortable for sure. So there would have to be some thermal shielding between the wearable and your skin. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm kind of curious about the similarities and differences between like the robotic fabric and the robotic skin. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so the skins are, well, we had two different ideas with these, but there's a lot of commonalities. The skins were based on continuous membranes. So most of our robotic skins are elastomer based. Um, and we embedded you know, actuators and sensors within the skin. And the, the concept there was to try to turn inanimate objects into robots by wrapping the, them in these robotic skins and um, you know, creating robots on the fly. With robotic fabrics, uh, we, didn't, we were overlooking continuous membranes and you know, focusing completely on fabrics and really wanted to retain the fiber architecture and the mechanical properties associated with those unique fiber architectures. So that's why we had to transition all of our kind of membrane aerial based actuators that we were using in the robotic skins into fiber based actuators, sensors, structures in the robotic fabrics. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I think at the beginning you compared uh, soft robots to soft biological systems. Yeah. And I think, uh, okay, my impression is that uh, one of the places where robotic systems are lagging behind biological systems is in the sensor density. We all heard great yeah. stories about how many sensors there are in our fingertips. So do you think the current approaches are going to scale up to the human or the biological level of sensor density? Or do you think it's going to take something radically different? Yeah. I think that's a really topical question. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about that, actually. And we're in the process of sensorizing, especially the, the turtle project right now. So the turtle that you saw doesn't have any sensors on board. Um, there's no autonomous anything in that robot. It's completely tell it's, it's open, you know, open loop gates that are pre-programmed in there. And out of the video frame, you know, my students are sitting there saying, OK, it's in a new environment, transition now. Um, so it's completely <coughs> tele-operated. Um, uh, so sensor density, let me, let me tackle your, your question in two parts. So I do, I agree that the sensor density, you know, our ability, especially our tactile ability is incredible. And I agree, I hear this all the time, you know, the, the resolution, the density of um, tactile information that we have is just incredible. And then there's the question of, well, do we need to match that? You know, do we need to have that same, is that, is that our goal to have that same sensor density in robots? And I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't have a good answer to that question. I can say that with our robot, um, we are trying to put a minimal number of sensors on board in order to minimally reconstruct the environment or estimate the environment. So right now what we're doing is we're putting two cameras on board. So we have a camera at the front and a camera on the belly looking down at the ground. Um, and then we had discussed putting in uh, pressure sensors on the feet so that we could get some information about contact with the ground as well as proprioceptive sensors within the limb in order to close the loop on the morphology of the limb. But we've actually moved in another direction. My student had this super clever idea. He said, you know, our limb, we can almost use it as an AFM tip and we have this ability to change in stiffness. So we can stiffen the limb and we can do two things. We can tap the ground and we can check what what we're getting out of the motor torques when we tap the ground. And then we can also put it in contact with the ground and just twist. And we can do the same thing. We can grab the motor torques. And we can do that both in stiff form and in soft form. And between those two things, we should be able to get the coefficient of friction of the ground and also you know, some general 
ideas about the softness, the softness of the ground, uh, and maybe some incline information. Um, and so that's what we're working on right now. We're trying to actually not put any sensors in the limb, not introduce any new hardware, and utilize the, the motor torques and the shoulders with some motions in order to reconstruct information about the ground. But yeah, between vision um, and the motor torques and an IMU, we are hoping to minimally reconstruct the environment and then just create this library of representative environment and associated uh, shape gate pairs. Thank you. Yeah. at all for, for the turtle? Yes. Um, so in, in our nature paper, we did some pretty rigorous hydrodynamic testing. Um, we looked at the shape and we, you know, we, we put it in a water tunnel and measured for angle of attack. And so we found the appropriate, you know, where it should be in order to optimize, um, at least within our uh, programmed, rudimentary, you know, non-optimized gates um, to try to lower that cost of transport as much as possible. Um, our newest iteration, you might have noticed, actually, if I can even go back um, to the version of the robot that we have now, this guy. Um, I have a slide here. Sorry, can you see that? Okay, cool. Um, so I didn't include this in the main presentation. Is it going to let me show it? Great. Cool, yeah, so this is what I was talking about with the kirigami cuts in the limb for the layer jamming. But you can see here, if you remember the former limb, um, that this one looks a lot more blocky, right? Like it just doesn't look as flat in flipper mode. So the hydrodynamics of our new limb are actually significantly worse. Um, we use the new limb, the new design, in only paddling gates because the, the, the lift-based gates were not efficacious. <laughs> um, but you can also see in our leg mode that this is why it works so much better in terrestrial mode. So in our initial version of the robot, um, the published version in Nature, it actually demonstrates it has much better hydrodynamic efficiency than it does have terrestrial efficiency. And in our newest version, we've swung the other way. So now we have better terrestrial efficiency and worse hydrodynamic efficiency. And so you know, we're going to have to find something settling in the middle. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. It was really nice for you to see everything. Um, I'm curious, as you have this kind of great ability to then transform some of the kind of structural properties, and I'm curious if that has changed how you look at material selection for your robots. If you have the structure that can do the stiffening for you, then maybe then what are, has it changed or affected at all how you do that material selection process for what you include in your designs or don't include? Or are there some kind of frustration points with that? Yeah, good question. Um, I think, so certainly just given my lab's core competency and what, what we know how to do, we try to solve problems with material function rather than mechanical function. Yeah. Um, so where there are, you know, I think many of the things that we do, like variable stiffness, uh, like, you know, actuation sensing, there are, um, there are rigid analogs, right? And they could even be designed to do, you know, the morphing, the things that our soft robots do. Um, so it starts to beg the question, you know, why softness? Why are we making these soft in the first place? And I have been asked that. I've been, you know, asked why, you know, if you only have this really simple, in the turtle case, for example, it's just a simple, you know, flat cross section to popped out cross section. Could you not do that with a stable, by stable mechanism? You know, something that is more reliably or you know, more modelable, I guess, um, rigid materials. And my argument there would be going towards the future. I think you know, if we discretize things enough that we can, that you get the same almost continuous curvatures as you would see in a soft deforming material, um, if you were to do that with a rigid discretized analog that you would have such a density of hardware that it's actually way more complex, right? So we can achieve, it's a simpler solution to just make it out of soft materials. Um, so for functions like morphing, I think we gravitate towards these softer materials and then we say, okay, well, we need to be able to bear loads. This robot's quite heavy. We need it to be able to hold itself up on land. You know, how do we build in variable stiffness? So we always look towards designing materials that will solve these problems. Um, 
Whereas, you know, I think that it, ultimately the most efficient, simplest, best solution is probably some combination of mechanical design and material design meeting in the middle. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And then, sorry, just real quick, because I don't work in textiles as much, I'm curious, like a similar question, what do you, are there things that you look for when you're selecting a textile for some of your oh, morphing just like textiles? The, the yeah, like what are, yeah, what are the, like when you're shopping around for textile, what is, <laughs> what are you shopping for? Yeah, so, uh, so all of the demonstrations that you saw were using either cotton or muslin. We use just really standard textile materials. Um, and some of our newest capacitive sensors uh, where we've been using you know, different inert dielectrics, we use either cotton or nylon um, or polyester. So we're always choosing really common textiles. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think part of the motivation is that textiles in general, they're, you know, they're, they've been designed for so many different application spaces, like heat resistance, fire resistance, um, you know, things that are designed to, to do, you know, to be very good in very specific applications, and that's kind of what we wanted to retain, right? Can we take the neat architectures, the design of those fibers, and the way that they've been either you know, knit or woven, um, for specific mechanical properties and retain those things while also adding in new functions. So it's not, the selection of the neat fabric so far hasn't been a huge consideration. Um, we've just been taking you know, really common things but trying to retain their, their neat properties. Um, but that should apply to any technical fabric in the future as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks. All, all right, so I think we are out of time. Let's thank Rebecca one more time. Thank you.